Thank you so much, Ambassador, for taking the time to speak to us. I think let me start with the latest events because we are hearing reports uh, that um, there has been a, an agreement of sorts of peace talks, but uh, that Kiev is saying that as much as it wants to hold talks with Russia, it's not going to hold talks in, in Belarus. Are you aware if there is some sort of conclusion about peace talks, where and when? Uh, first of all, thank you for having me uh, here. Um, it's a valuable opportunity for us to expose, uh, to explain our uh, point of view on what's going on. I am not updated uh, every hour or so, so I, I do not know what's going on uh, about uh, peace, peace talks or possible peace talks. I heard that uh, Ukrainian side already once agreed to have peace talks and uh, yeah, our troops were given order to uh, suspend any uh, action, but then uh, uh, Ukrainian President Zelensky withdrew his consent to have peace talks and uh, hostilities resumed. But, but this is uh, how much I am updated on this and, and uh, sorry, I'm not, I do not have any special uh, latest information on that. So what you're saying is that the situation is fluid, but how concerned are you about the casualties that we're hearing um, of the effect of the conflict? The United Nations are releasing a statement a short while ago saying there's some 150,000 refugees that have crossed into neighboring countries, Poland, Hungary, Romania, Moldova, and they've also been accusations by Kiev of the Kremlin bombing uh, orphanages, kindergartens uh, in the capital of Kiev. What is your response to this? Are you concerned about the humanitarian effects of this conflict? Of course, of course, I'm uh, very much concerned. Uh, we didn't want any hostilities with Ukraine. As our president said, uh, we were left no choice, no other option. We were compelled to have this military operation. And we still consider uh, Ukrainians uh, our brothers and sisters. Uh, we uh, do though think that uh, they are governed from outside to a very large extent. And that uh, everything that happened uh, to a large extent, uh, we, both of our peoples view uh, it owe it to, to, to some external force. Mm. Uh, as for shelling, uh, uh, premeditated shelling uh, uh, of bridges and kindergartens, this is an outright lie. On the Russian side, uh, including our president, we have on many occasions uh, emphasized that uh, we, our military act only and exclusively against military infrastructure, infrastructure in Ukraine as one of the purposes of this special military operation announced by President Putin is a demilitarization of Ukraine. So uh, if uh, some civilians uh, suffered, uh, this is, this is uh, a big loss for, for us, uh, just as for Ukrainians themselves. Okay. And you say, we'll, we'll come to the issue of foreign or outside interference in just a moment, Ambassador. There was some also, there's some news that we had earlier on as well, and that is to suggest that Russia has put nuclear deterrence forces on high alert. We understand President Putin says this as a result of a statement by NATO. Do you think it will come to that, an exchange of a nuclear armor of missiles? I, I didn't hear... Uh what you, you, you mentioned about the Russian nuclear forces, I don't know, I cannot comment on that. Okay. So I hope it will, we will not get there because uh, if we will have a nuclear war, then there may be nothing left on, on this globe. All right, so- Everyone, I think that everyone realizes that. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, we'll, we'll get to the issue of whether everybody realizes that or agrees or not, Ambassador, but you say, 
we are here as in the Ukraine and Russia because of outside interference. To whom are you referring? And has diplomacy failed? Because I seem to remember that there was a meeting of the NATO Russia Council in Brussels, I think uh, towards the end of January to discuss the situation. Well, um... I think that it was dedicated, that meeting that you referred to uh, was dedicated to some other uh, subject matter. Maybe the situation in uh, <coughs> Ukraine uh, was discussed there, raised up there, but uh, certainly the main issue was something else. And uh, uh, yes, to a certain extent, diplomacy has failed as um, uh, in order to have a full picture of, of what is going on. Uh, one has to get over just the situation in Ukraine, specifically in Ukraine, but to put it in a broader, much broader perspective, including historical perspective. Uh, I mean, in particular, the NATO expansion since 1991, uh, since the moment they have promised us not to expand any further to, to the East, and uh, uh, then um, the role that is ascribed to Ukraine in these uh, plans and uh, uh, several other elements, in particular the rise of neo-Nazism and ultra-nationalism in Ukraine, uh, the war in Donbass, the war that has been going on for eight years, uh, that uh, the regime in Kyiv of, uh, conducted against uh, its own population. And then um, the dismantling basically by United States of America of the system of arms control and verification. And we do not call it disarmament anymore because it's uh, the opposite process uh, that's going on now. Um, as you know, um, uh, Americans withdrew unilaterally from a number of arms control agreements, and so on and so forth. So um, uh, the snapshot of the current situation in Ukraine does not give an adequate idea of what uh, the security concerns of Russia in Europe uh, is uh, or are. And uh, um, uh, we, we have to have a broader look at that. Okay, so the issue of the commitment made for NATO not to expand seems to be somewhat of a contentious issue. In fact, I had a conversation with a professor, former NATO chief of staff employee, uh, denying that there was ever any commitment at that meeting, March 6, 1991. But I understand the Spiegel says that there is evidence uh, that uh, there was uh, not only uh, agreement amongst the foreign ministers of the US, the UK, France, and Germany that was made clear to, um, or that NATO will not expand its borders past the Eastern borders of Germany. This was apparently said by the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Europe and Canada, Raymond Seitz, but there are those who, de who deny that. I've seen an interview where President Putin uh, says there is evidence of these documents. The Allies are saying there's no evidence of these documents. Does this make it difficult, the fact that there was a, an agreement with the principle or not of NATO expansion, though NATO does deny the fact that it's expanded to a point where it breaches Russian security? Well, um, we, we on our side, we know uh, for sure, uh, and I personally do know for sure, that there have been guarantees that the NATO will not expand to the East. Being a young diplomat, I've read uh, minutes of several uh, meetings that took place in the uh, 1990, 1991. I worked uh, in the legal department at that time, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty much sure about what I saw at that time. So if uh, evidence is um, uh, on our side, uh, should not, must not be taken into consideration. Then, of course, uh, it, it, is, it is difficult. And um, we have to 
leave it to some researchers uh, in the West to try to find some traces there because obviously uh, my, my, I suspect they, they have been cleared in order to not leave uh, you know, any traces of, of such promises. But uh, some 20 years ago, nobody con um, uh, contested the fact that there were, the guarantees were given and that promises were made and uh, that there are papers, uh, well, maybe they're just made classified, I don't, I don't know. But uh, everything you hear uh, to the opposite uh, from on that is just an outright lie. And the reason I ask this question is about the value not only of the existence of uh, the NATO Russia Council, because if there was an agreement, a principal agreement on um, A, I'd imagine the respect of the sovereignty of states, including Ukraine, but including what Russia says is in the endangerment of its national security. Uh, have relations broken down to such a point that Russia feels that there is no room for diplomacy because then doesn't it make a fuss of overtures now of saying, let's sit down around the table and discuss the way forward? Well, we, we tried, we did our best. We tried to you know, uh, convince our Westerner I cannot call them partners anymore. Um, uh, opponents, uh, not to uh, expand, uh, not to go east uh, for many years. I, I can refer you and, and the listeners uh, to the uh, intervention by President Putin on, uh, at Munich conference in uh, February 2007, exactly 15 years ago. And he, he warned against the NATO ex expansion to the uh, east. And he spoke about uh, 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 the balance between the multipolar and uh, unipolar uh, world and, and uh, the, the trends that um, uh, are uh, developing in the world uh, and so on. And um, so 15 years later, uh, we have uh, NATO knocking at our door, putting more and more uh, military troops and infrastructure right on our borders. Uh, from that point of view, uh, Ukraine uh, has a significant role as uh, if uh, NATO troops appeared in Ukraine, uh, they would have been very close to Moscow. And from uh, the point of view of strategic defense, that was completely uh, unacceptable uh, as flying time by uh, cruise missiles from the territory of Ukraine to Moscow would be five, seven, eight minutes. And uh, that would have left us defenseless. Uh, that was unacceptable. We talked about that many times. We warned uh, the Western colleagues uh, on, on dozens and hundreds of occasions and the last attempt was undertaken just last year, as in December, uh, we uh, submitted uh, to the United States of America and to the NATO a block uh, as such, uh, two very similar draft um, agreements on uh, mutual uh, guarantees, uh, mutual security guarantees. And uh, basically what we heard was no, and then uh, the very last attempt uh, was uh, as a letter by uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov to his counterparts in the Western NATO countries about how then they understand and interpret the principle that was negotiated in the OSC and enshrined in its uh, several of its documents, in particular 1999 Istanbul Declaration, Istanbul Declaration on equal and uh, indivisible security. Mm. And uh, again, what we heard was uh, that, uh, that they simply do, do not want to implement this principle. They, they, they do not consider it as, as a principle that they are supposed to be following. So uh, that, that, uh, that is so much about uh, the diplomatic uh, efforts. And uh, uh, yes, this, this part was futile. 
As for Russian NATO Council, um, for quite uh, some time already, it hadn't been working. Uh, the meeting that you referred to um, took place after uh, many months of interruption of any political dialogue with NATO. That was uh, interrupted by uh, the NATO side. Russian diplomats working in uh, the uh, our permanent mission in Brussels, permanent mission to NATO, uh, were expelled and uh, uh, any political dialogue cut. No, Ambassador, allow, so, me uh, say, yes? uh, allow me to come in and say NATO says that's because, and I quote, practical cooperation has been suspended since 2014 in response to Russia's illegal and illegitimate annexation of Crimea, Ukraine, which NATO will never recognize, political and military channels of communication remain open, it says. And it says uh, Russia has breached the values, principles, commitments that underpin the NATO-Russia relationship as outlined in the 1997 basic document of the Euro-Atlantic Partnership Council, the 1997 NATO-Russia Founding Act, the 2002 Rome Declaration. So uh, we've seen what happened at the United Nations um, Security Council yesterday, the vote which was supported by 11 uh, countries in terms of the draft on the understanding of what Russia has done and the labeling of Russia as an aggressor. There were countries that abstained, um, mainly allies, um, China, Russia, but what multilateral institution can bring about peace? And uh, Russia has been a part of the security apparatus for a very long time. Why have you failed, in your view, to prevent things from reaching this point? Well, um, of course, uh, people in the West, uh, in uh, NATO, uh, no, not all the people actually, but I mean, uh, colleagues, diplomats, military people, uh, they uh, did not accept the results of the referendum uh, that uh, Crimeans hold. Uh, but uh, uh, about 94% of the eligible voters in Crimea, which have had a population at the time uh, over 2 million, it is about the same right now, maybe a little bit more. Uh, so 94% of eligible voters uh, uh, showed up at the polls stations and uh, more than 96% of them voted for reunification uh, with Russia. If this is not democracy, then I do not know what is. But uh, uh, of course, uh, but it, it didn't suit uh, NATO's approaches to, to, to Ukraine, to Russia, and uh, they, they do not recognize these, these, uh, these results, and they keep saying that, uh, you know, they keep naming it uh, aggression and uh, annexation and so on and so forth. But uh, this is just uh, uh, an illustration of, of a double standard approaches uh, that uh, our Westerner, Western colleagues uh, apply in, in uh, uh, basically same situations. Because uh, if you take example of Kosovo, that was uh, quite the opposite. Um, uh, Ambassador, the, I'd yes. I'd yes. Like to from yeah, please go ahead. You mentioned earlier on the interference of, of foreigners. You mentioned the historical context of why Russia and Ukraine find themselves where they are. So there are those who say, firstly, Russia has said it has not started a war, it's continuing a war. And it was referring, I understand, to uh, the Maidan revolution or coup, depending on, uh, you know, where you sit on what happened then. But is this what you mean by foreign interference? Because there's a view that the spat with Europe and the United States actually traces back to then. Your view on that? Uh, well, um, I think that um, uh, historically, again, if you go back a few years, uh, Ukrainians were put uh, in front of a very uh, tough and uh, completely false dichotomy. 
that is, uh, the European Union at that time said, it's, you are either with Russia or with us. And uh, President Yanukovych in uh, 2012, 2013, uh, 2014, had to make uh, uh, some, some very difficult choices. He negotiated, uh, Ukrainian government negotiated a partnership agreement with the European Union at that time, uh, uh, while Ukraine enjoyed a um, uh, very preferable regime of uh, economic cooperation with Russia. Uh, just imagine that uh, half of the Russian budget, which we uh, used to spend on military hardware, uh, went to Ukraine. This is unthinkable for maybe any other country in any other situation. About half of, of our uh, uh, budget uh, for uh, acquisition of weapon, weapons for the Russian military went to another country. Uh, so, of course, uh, Ukrainians uh, were about to lose a very profitable, um, very um, stable economic cooperation with Russia. But EU insisted uh, on, on, on this, uh, uh, that Ukrainians had to make this choice. Why? Why so? Why cannot Ukraine uh, be trading with the European Union and with uh, Russia and other uh, post-Soviet states as well? Um, so uh, these, these kind of dividing lines, again, President Putin referred to, to drawing such lines, new such lines. He, 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 he referred to the fall of Berlin Wall. Uh, that was broken into pieces and uh, sold as uh, souvenirs. Uh, but he, already in the year 2007, he, he said about, he warned uh, against uh, drawing new dividing walls uh, and lines in Europe. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened. That was exactly the stance by the, the European Union that Ukrainians had to decide. Uh, and uh, so President Yanukovych at that time uh, uh, became hesitant a little bit uh, by the end of the year 2013. And he said, like, folks, let, let's, let's reassess the situation. What are we losing and what are we gaining? Let's have a look at it again. And immediately a protest, a violent protest in Maidan, in center Kiev, uh, has begun. Uh, Obviously, uh, the situation did not require that kind of action and the, from the opposition. And uh, yes, uh, people might have been uh, unhappy with the, his presidency, but uh, nev nevertheless, President Yanukovych was recognized as a legitimate president by everyone, by all states, including European Union member states and the United States and so on. So uh, this situation was uh, brought to, to, to a very um, high degree of boiling. And, and uh, then, uh, let me remind you again, on, in uh, February uh, of the year 2014, uh, an agreement between opposition and the government of President Yanukovych was brokered by Russia, France, uh, Poland, and Germany. It was uh, signed in the evening of the 20th of February, and in the morning of the 21st of February, it was broken by the opposition, who, who, who proclaimed itself uh, the, the only power in the country, and uh, uh, the violence uh, broke, broke out. So uh, that, 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 that's the uh, events uh, in, in the capital of Ukraine and the uh, diplomacy worked as hard as it could be working. Uh, but uh, 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 so some people in, in Ukraine uh, didn't accept such results. And uh, in particularly in Eastern Ukraine, people said that uh, having looked at the first action by the uh, new authorities, they said, no, we don't want to live like that. Because one of the first acts uh, by the uh, opposition that uh, came to power as a result of such coup d'etat 
which is 100% pure coup d'etat and nothing else. It was unconstitutional. Unfortunately, it was uh, uh, immediately recognized by, by the West. Uh, uh, but uh, one of the first uh, acts uh, that uh, uh, were adopted by uh, the opposition uh, gaining power was prohibition of the use of Russian language. And uh, as you know, probably uh, many people in the east of Ukraine, in the south of Ukraine, including Crimea, uh, to a certain extent in other parts of Ukraine, in Kyiv itself, uh, uh, they uh, consider themselves being Russians. And at that time, about 80% of the population of Ukraine, by the way, spoke uh, uh, Russian at home. So uh, basically what happened, the ultranationalists uh, hijacked uh, power from legitimate government, uh, legitimate president Yanukovych, and uh, started acting uh, as, as, as ultranationalists and neo-Nazis, whose uh, weight in, in the political life of Ukraine is uh, absolutely uh, disproportionate. Uh, 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 many different acts followed, and uh, some some uh, uh, skirmishes uh, followed as well in the east of this uh, country. And since then, there has been a low intensity conflict, a low intensity civil war that was going on, and that the world media didn't want to talk about. So and this had to be stopped. Yes. Let's talk about that because I'm assuming when you talk about um, the ultra right and their hijacking of uh, the Maidan protests, you are referring to Svoboda that has been documented. Uh, Russian president saying not so long ago that Ukraine government is dominated by neo Nazis. Is is it in reference to Svoboda? And when you talk about outside of interference, are you talking about uh, the support of the United States to uh, parties like Svoboda? There is a meeting recorded between Senator John McCain and Chris Murphy, who was the leader of Svoboda at the time. Is this what you mean by outside interference? Because some people say, it's not that the United States stoked the war, but what it did perhaps was take advantage of already fractious environment. Um, listen, um, I remember uh, the first, I think, Deputy Secretary of State, Victoria Nuland, uh, a few years ago, uh, if my recollection is good, that was in 2015 or 16, saying herself openly, that United States have invested uh, more than five billion US dollars in promoting democracy in Ukraine. This promotion of democracy, quote unquote, uh, led to a bloody uh, unconstitutional coup d'etat in Ukraine. And yes, uh, we think that uh, Ukrainian government is under heavy influence of uh, ultranationalists and the neo Nazis. And there are pictures of all kinds of manifestations uh, of, of, of this, like the, the, the restoration of um, uh, uh, the glory, well, let's, uh, if I may say so, of uh, Waffen SS divisions composed of Ukrainians uh, during the Second World War, the glorification of the collaborationists, collab collab mm -hmm. collab like uh, mm -hmm. Shukhevich and uh, Bendera, uh, who are now uh, promoted to the rank of national heroes. And there are torch marches and uh, there are nationalist battalions uh, uh, who grew with time in into regiments uh, uh, wearing openly the Nazi swastika and uh, similar insignia and so on and so forth. And nobody, nobody in Western Europe, in Europe, in, uh, in the Western general, objected to that. Just like such things happen in uh, some of the capitals of Baltic states, where uh, veterans of Waffen SS divisions march uh, on the central squares in, 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 in of their capital cities, and so on. 
Nobody referred to that going on in, uh, in Ukraine. Very few people knew about that. All these human rights uh, paragons and, and uh, the democracy promoters uh, were silent about that for many years, for many years. And uh, this uh, led in particular uh, to, uh, uh, to the policy that uh, the central government in Ukraine was conducting that is very close uh, to genocide. Uh, Russian population was and is discriminated in Ukraine uh, along many lines uh, on uh, language issue, on cultural issue, uh, films uh, prohibited uh, from Russia, they, they, people cannot listen to uh, Russian pop music and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, this is discrimination uh, on a racial uh, uh, criterion. Uh, and what, what Donbass is concerned, people were killed there systematically. Uh, most of, of the victims uh, from these 14 to 15,000 uh, people killed, uh, that, uh, that's the number that is usually referred to, uh, they are uh, on the side on the, of these two uh, republics, Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics, uh, very recently, until very recently, do not recognize by anybody. But... Um, uh, it, it happened. Uh, there, there is plenty of evidence to that, and uh, there is an uh, OEC monitoring mission uh, uh, which corroborates that, though um, the numbers uh, usually of shelling from uh, Ukrainian side that uh, are provided by Russian monitors are about twice higher than uh, those of the OEC monitors. But still, uh, it shows uh, a very uh, graphic imbalance in, in favor, so to speak, of uh, the uh, military action against uh, civilian population, population from uh, the Ukrainian military. Right. Again, uh, world media did not speak uh, about that. Of, of course, uh, there is a question why. Uh, we have our re uh, re uh, responses to that, replies. Uh, but uh, that had to be stopped, in particular that. Okay, so uh, let's talk about this selection bias in contextualizing uh, this uh, current conflict. At the United Nations Security Council, Kenya said that we have to look at this from the prism of... Um, for instance, Africa and colonial borders. And I'd like to hear what your response is to that. And I'd want to juxtapose that against what the Russian delegate at the Security Council during the vote on the draft resolution had to say that Russia cannot compete or with the United States on the number of conflicts uh, that it's been involved in invasions or interference. Is there a similarity in these situations, both these situations that I've uh, quoted? No, well, I, I think that both comparisons are completely wrong. Uh, and uh, of course, I'm uh, of the same view as my colleague and friend our permanent representative uh, in uh, the United uh, Nations and in the UN Security Council. Uh, we, we cannot compete with Americans by, by uh, such numbers. We uh, never organized uh, a, a color revolution or a coup d'etat in any uh, other state. And uh, unless we are invited, we never appeared uh, elsewhere. Uh, meaning interfering in domestic affairs. Um, on the other hand, um, I, I do not know exactly what um, uh, our colleague uh, from Kenya meant when he said that, what was your, your quotation from him in, in the UNSC. Uh, but uh, Russia has uh, never been a, a colonial state. Right, just then going forward, what are your expectations in terms of uh, support? Uh, this matter surely goes to the United Nations General Assembly. 
do you think that there would be more support for Russia? I mean, there's a lot of talk from the Allied forces of unity in uh, Europe against Russian aggression, to quote them. Do you think that there is a greater resonance with your actions in some quarters? Although some people say, irrespective of the justification, war is war, and it is wrong of Russia to invade a sovereign nation. Again, uh, it is wrong to the extent, uh, uh, in as much as, as you look at this situation uh, uh, in isolation, if you take into consideration the whole context of uh, security issues, uh, strategic security issues, that includes uh, geopolitical uh, combinations and intriguing, uh, the expansion of NATO, uh, NATO, uh, announcing, proclaiming Russia, declaring Russia as an enemy state, uh, spreading um, potential warfare to such areas as uh, open space and cyberspace, in addition to land, air, and sea, as it used to be. Uh, if you take into consideration the basically the dismantling of the uh, arms control system by United States of America. Uh, if you take into consideration the spread of uh, US military around our borders, uh, the increase of their uh, military installations, the, so if I may say so, military cultivation of new and new uh, states around us, then uh, you, you would see uh, plus uh, the discrimination of the Russian uh, population in Ukraine, which uh, does remind uh, very strongly to me uh, apartheid system. Uh, maybe this is what our Kenyan colleague meant. Then I, I agree with him. Uh, and uh, taken together, uh, all these factors uh, just compelled us uh, uh, into a military operation in Ukraine. Uh, this is this is a very uh, sad development, but we, as our president said, had no other choice. Thank you. Yeah. Just a quick and final question, Ambassador. Uh, Russia has uh, said it's concerned about the building of uh, Ukraine or Ukraine bases in, is it Ochakiv? I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, and another in Bedansk. Yet at the same time, Russia had... Um, you know, uh, drills, military naval drills on February 19th. Are the two military capacitation exercises similar or not? Uh, they, they are, well, they look similar. Of course, soldiers running around, tanks uh, driving around. Uh, yes, the picture is, is the same, uh, maybe, or very similar. Uh, but uh, Russian uh, troops uh, had drills on the Russian territory. And we had joint drills with the Belarusian troops on, in, in Belarus in particular. Uh, NATO troops had drills in the territory of Ukraine, which is not a NATO member. This is not, as they uh, like to put it, NATO territory. And uh, the if you take, for example, such uh, the balance of force, the rapport de force, um, NATO has a numerical advantage over Russia in every category, uh, whatever you take, uh, tanks, aircrafts, and so on, 10 to 12 times. Russian military budget is less than 50 billion US dollars. Just the military budget of just one country in NATO of the United States is 800, over 850 billion US dollars. Are we a threat to NATO? How could it be? And then uh, there were uh, many drills that were conducted by NATO and they are always presented as defensive and Russian drills are always presented as danger. And uh, th this is simply propaganda. This is simply propaganda. Uh, we are not a threat uh, to NATO. We cannot wage a war. We cannot be a threat to anyone. 
uh, from NATO bloc, and we do not want to be a threat to anyone else, and we are not. And uh, uh, Ukrainians had a choice, Ukrainian authorities had a choice. They didn't need to uh, strive to join NATO 